Hey everyone, thanks so much for taking the time to make the trip out to see this talk. Uh, but seriously though, uh, we hope you and your loved ones are safe and healthy uh, during these unusual times. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about eradicating vulnerability classes by shelving SAST and embracing secure defaults and invariants. So uh, this talk is going to take a bit of a different angle uh, than many tools, talks, and really the industry as a whole. Um, so there's a number of benefits to this different approach we're going to be describing. Um, first is that uh, it's going to enable us to focus on killing bug classes uh, rather than one-off uh, ad hoc wins. And this enables us to be very scalable and systematic as AppSec programs and really get some nice long-term wins. We're going to talk about how to enable developers to move fast and securely and how the security team can be business enablers, not another point of friction. And most importantly, we're going to talk about a methodology as well as some concrete action steps uh, on how to do this at your company using free and open source tools. But before we get into it, a little bit about us. Uh, so my name is Clint. I'm currently the head of security research at R2C. And before that, I was a research director and technical director at NCC Group, which is a global consulting firm where I did uh, pen testing as well as helping companies scale their security with security automation as well as uh, DevSecOps practices. Uh, before that, I was an uh, indentured servant, uh, I mean grad student at UC Davis. Uh, and today I'm joined by Isaac, who is one of the co-founders and CEO of R2C, uh, previously was at MIT uh, and MIT Lincoln Labs. All right, so here's a big picture what this talk is about. So first we're going to give some sort of background and motivation about why bug finding isn't the answer. Then we're gonna talk about how to eradicate vulnerability classes, sort of a high level methodology of how to do so. And then we're gonna get into the nitty gritty in a bit more detail about how uh, to actually do this in practice using uh, the right tools and techniques. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about the sort of future of security and where we believe things are headed and how security teams and framework uh, creators can collaborate. All right, so first, uh, why bug finding isn't the answer. So in the past five, 10, and 15 years, software development has changed a lot. And because of that, security teams need to as well. Based on uh, chats I've had with friends of mine at many different companies, uh, there's sort of this new reality many security teams are facing. Uh, specifically, you know, security teams often can't hard block engineering. That is, if there's something developers want to do, very rarely can the security team say no, unless it's something very uh, important and critical. Uh, security can no longer be point in time. It must be continuous. And many security teams are focused on building, you know, like security engineering rather than just breaking and finding bugs. Uh, and no longer are security teams sort of like this isolated uh, working on their own uh, type team and, and force within a company. Often now they are embedded or at least partnered closely with development teams. So uh, because there's all these changes in how things are working, uh, I think that it's important for us to revisit our prior assumptions about how to be most effective as security teams in supporting our company's mission, given that so the world is very different than it used to be. And I think there's some uh, analogous things in just sort of broader tech in general. Um, there's been some significant shifts from how we used to do things to how things are done now. <clears throat> Here's a couple of examples. So uh, we used to use uh, waterfall development where uh, programming happened over long periods of time. And now uh, there's this big uh, adoption of agile where things are rapid and iterative. Uh, previously, there was very separate uh, dev and ops teams, uh, and now many companies are embracing DevOps where these functions uh, are partially or wholly merged. Previously, many uh, servers for your company were probably on-prem, uh, but now there's this massive adoption of the cloud. So in all of these cases, uh, it hasn't been sort of an immediate jump uh, from the left to the right side, but there has over time been this gradual shift as we as an industry realize, hey, there's actually a lot of benefits to doing things a, a very different way. And I think there's a similar equally important shift happening in security, where previously we were focusing on finding vulnerabilities. But now, based on talks I've had with a number of very forward thinking smart security teams, we're instead leaning towards secure defaults and invariants. And what I mean by invariant is just uh, a property uh, about the code or the system as a whole that must either always or never be true. And what we're gonna talk about is how by setting strong invariants, this is going to let you 
uh, significantly de-risk systems uh, and really have some nice scalable security wins. And sort of the key insight here is that when you don't need any context to make a decision, like in this case, we always either block or deny, for example, uh, this requires no operational time for the security team, which lets you sort of uh, knock off a bunch of different wins and then uh, focus on other things. So again, becoming more leveraged with your time. Okay, so i uh, gonna give you a couple of motivating examples. So let's say I gave you a random web application that you've never seen before and asked you, does this have cross-site scripting in it? So knowing nothing about it, nothing about it, you probably would have a number of questions like, okay, well, what can the user provide? Um, you know, what's the structure of that data? Is it uh, just like numbers? Is it strings? Is it sort of arbitrary uh, JSON data? Once the web app gets it, is this input filtered before it's uh, stored to the database? How is the information stored in the database in terms of, you know, is it uh, converted to say integers and floats? Is it strings? Is it arbitrary JSON data? Maybe we care about if it's MySQL versus Postgres. Uh, when the data is returned from the database, uh, does the web application do any additional filtering and processing? Uh, does it output encode it uh, when it's sent to the browser? Uh, where is the user input included in the page? Is it in HTML or an HTML attribute or JavaScript or all sorts of things? So to be able to reason about the security properties of the system, there's like a lot of questions we have. But what if I were to instead say, um, hey, we've enforced this invariant on the code. That is, all of the front end is React, and we banned the API called dangerously set in our HTML. Now, React is a great example of a secure by default framework where it's essentially impossible, or at least very difficult, to introduce cross-site scripting at all uh, anywhere, uh, except for a handful uh, of places where you can basically opt out of the framework protections, um, dangerously set in our HTML being one of those. So if I were to tell you that everything is React and we've basically banned all of the places where you can do something dangerous, probably a lot of these questions that you used to have are suddenly a lot less uh, impactful because we've sort of mitigated classes of risk and sort of broad swath, lots of things we like don't have to care about as much anymore. Uh, so similarly, Let's say I gave you a, a random app that had uh, and asked you, hey, does this have remote code execution issues in it? So similarly, you probably have a number of the same questions, uh, but also perhaps you would want to know, does this app uh, deserialize data? Does it run uh, shell commands as sort of subprocess uh, shell exec type things? Does it perhaps mix data and code using eval exec or other things? Uh, but again, let's say that I have set a strong invariance where I have banned calls to exec and eval, and there's no way to do um, shell commands, and it doesn't deserialize anything. Um, so then probably uh, a lot of these things that you used to be worried about uh, are significantly less risky. And I like to think of this as, you know, let's just solve the easy version of the problem, right? So these apps could be incredibly complex with millions of lines of code. Uh, but with some strong invariants, some strong properties that we are enforcing, we have significantly reduced the risk of these applications, even though uh, there's a lot of things we might not necessarily know. Uh, an important point is we did this you know, without very fancy, complex tools. right? So we didn't have a very powerful uh, dynamic analysis tool, DAST, that can handle you know, modern web applications and all the uh, intricacies that that entails. We didn't use a SAS tool that could do complex interprocedural data flow analysis, tracking you know, tainted user input across dozens of files and maybe millions of lines of code. Uh, we didn't do fuzzing or symbolic execution or formal methods like proving the correctness of the code. We were, we were able to make strong guarantees about the security properties of our system without all of these heavyweight approaches. So one way I like to think about this is the task versus the effort required. So on the y-axis, we have uh, the effort required in CHUs, uh, which is uh, Clint's hand-wavy units. And basically, in the lower left-hand side, we see you know, detecting either the use uh, or the lack of use of a secure library. Uh, computationally, that's pretty easy, right? We don't need a lot of contextual knowledge. We can just sort of look for the APIs and function calls being made. So that's pretty easy. But if we want to find something that's potentially a bug, then we need to do a, a bit more of analysis. Probably we need to reason about how user input either can or can't get to that uh, vulnerable code location. Uh, and then it's even more work to confirm whether that potential bug is actually a bug. And then it's even harder than that and takes more work and more either manual and or analysis complexity to write a proof of concept 
exploit code for that, demonstrating that yes, not only is this vulnerable, like here's something that actually uh, attacks it. And fundamentally, what I'm trying to get at here is detecting uh, the use or lack of use of secure defaults is just so much easier than finding bugs. But if you have these strong secure defaults that make uh, exploitable bugs impossible, or at least very difficult, then you don't necessarily have to find all the bugs because they just can't happen by construction. Uh, so we wanted to make sure to uh, connect with the youth these days. So we included this meme. Uh, so we would say broke is finding every vulnerability uh, and woke is preventing classes of vulnerabilities. All right, so you might be thinking right now, like, you know, cool, like I kind of buy into this, but really all you've shown me is some sort of hand wavy diagrams and the security industry has focused on bug finding for decades, right? Building very powerful, impressive SAS and DAS tools, spending a lot of money on pen tests and bug bounty. And you might be thinking, uh, yeah, this is just your opinion, man. Um, so we wanted to give you a number of examples of other companies who have come to similar conclusions. Uh, so first, this is a talk by Patrick and Asta of Netflix uh, a couple of years ago. So on the left-hand side, uh, under de-emphasized, this is their priorities for their AppSec program. They are de-emphasizing manual testing, so manual sort of like pen testing, as well as traditional vulnerability scanning. And then on the right-hand side, heavily emphasized is a uh, paved road that is uh, secure defaults and killing bug classes. This is another talk by Scott and Isha, also of Netflix. Um, so the following year at Upset Cali, notice how uh, secure by default is a core part of their security program. And notice that it's only growing over time. Earlier, we were talking about, uh, hey, like banning functions can be very powerful and you might be a bit skeptical, like how much is this actually valuable in practice? So one interesting study, so Microsoft crunched the numbers and they found that uh, when going from XP to Vista, 41% uh, or that is almost 50% uh, of all the vulnerability reduction in that transition that happened was basically from banning a uh, store copy and a number of other dangerous functions. So. Uh, that's a pretty impressive bang for your buck for essentially just you know banning a few functions. And a more recent blog post from uh, the Microsoft Security Research, uh, Response Center, uh, tools and guidance that is like developer training are just fundamentally not preventing memory safety issues. They have uh, represented the same proportion of vulnerabilities assigned to CVE for over a decade, right? So Microsoft is saying we've spent a huge amount of time building powerful like static uh, analysis tools as well as fuzzing and training developers, but ultimately, you know, we still have these same issues. Uh, Google recently uh, released a quite excellent book for free online called Building Secure and Reliable Systems, and here's a snippet from it. Uh, they say it's unreasonable to expect any developer to be an expert in all of these subjects or to constantly maintain uh, awareness of all these security issues when they're writing and reviewing code. Uh, a better approach is to have frameworks, languages, and libraries that make common security vulnerabilities impossible. Um, so I like both parts of this, but I want to focus on the first for a second, which is uh, I think in many cases, our expectations for developers are a bit unreasonable, right? We expect them to uh, build new features and provide value for the company, both quickly and write scalable code that is correct. Uh, and as they're doing all of these things, uh, we also expect them to be aware of all these security things that could go wrong, even though we as security professionals have spent years, perhaps even decades, uh, becoming more familiar with it. So I think ideally, and what this talk uh, is focused on is like, how can we make developers just not have to worry about security and instead just go about their jobs and uh, just transparently the uh, security team is supporting them and making them able to do, do their job easily as well as securely. Uh, so Facebook had a blog post designing security for billions uh, where they they present sort of this pyramid, but it's uh, sort of upside down where the, the base, um, sort of the bulwark of the whole thing is secure frameworks that they try to use to prevent and remove entire classes of bugs. Uh, and they use other things too, right? Like automated testing tools and peer review and so forth. But sort of the base, the thing that they uh, aim to catch the most bugs with is these secure frameworks. Okay, so you might be thinking, you know, this is great and all, but like I'm not Google, I'm not Netflix, uh, I'm not Facebook. Um, but you don't actually need to be these companies to get this value. Um, so you can get a lot of val the value by choosing modern web frameworks and well-supported libraries, uh, which can in themselves just mitigate entire classes of vulnerabilities. 
So if we think back to early 2000s, you know, web security was really a wild west. You know, cross-site scripting and SQL injection were everywhere, or at least quite prevalent. Uh, and once frameworks started output encoding by default and encouraging the use of ORMs or object relational mappers, a lot of these issues gradually, uh, they didn't completely go away, but they became much less uh, prevalent. So by using modern frameworks, as well as uh, secure by default libraries, I've included a couple of examples there. Uh, U2, even without a massive, well-resourced uh, AppSec team, you can get a lot of the same value. So it's not out of reach for you. OK, so let's talk uh, now in a bit more detail how to eradicate vulnerability classes. So in this section, we're going to present a methodology uh, and walk through each step. But before we do that, just quickly to zoom out for a second, you know, why do we care so much about killing bug classes rather than sort of one-off uh, bug fighting as we've sort of traditionally done as an industry? And the reason is that there's these huge compounding effects of killing uh, a bug class and not just a, a one-off bug here and there. And let's say, for example, you are a part of an AppSec team and you do sort of a time audit to try to figure out, OK, where do we spend our time? And let's say this is a hypothetical example. You're like, OK, well, we spend a fair amount of time on cross-site scripting. We also do threat modeling and training uh, and so forth. So let's say you were, to ab you were able to, say, uh, work with the engineering team and port everything to React or do other uh, secure by default mechanisms to essentially kill cross-site scripting. And then maybe it still happens every once in a while, but you essentially have to spend little uh, ongoing recurring time on it. Then all of that time you used to spend uh, addressing cross-site scripting, you can then focus on something else, perhaps uh, SQL injection. And by gradually eliminating all of these things you used to care about, you become much more leveraged and uh, highly scalable as a security team where you just knock off more and more problems uh, with even with the same number of people and not having to work uh, crazy hours. OK, so let's talk about the process itself of how to eradicate vulnerability classes. So first, we're going to evaluate which vulnerability class to focus on. So there's many things you could do, which is the thing that's uh, best to focus on first. Then we'll talk about determining the best approach to find or prevent a given bug class at scale. We'll then discuss like how do you select what the safe version should look like and how can you make it the default? How can you train developers to use the safe pattern? And then finally, how can we use tools to enforce the safe pattern so that uh, basically we have these strong invariant guarantees across uh, many repos? So there's many ways to decide on what you should focus on first. Uh, here's a couple of example criteria that different companies use, but ultimately it's up to you and what makes sense in your environment. So one thing you could do is focus on the bug classes that are most prevalent, so what's happening the most places. You could also focus on the bug classes that have the most impact or risk. So for example, let's say you, your company has a lot of uh, information disclosure type issues, but usually they are either informational or low risk. Then you might want to focus on bugs that are less common but more impactful. There, some bug classes may be easier to tackle, either from an organizational buy-in point of view or just technically it's easier to fix. And maybe your company has certain priorities uh, itself that you can abide by. So realistically, you probably want some sort of weighted function of all of these. Uh, but again, the important thing is uh, just what makes sense for your company and your circumstances. So in order to do this process, we're going to need a, a nice data set of vulnerabilities that have happened in the past so that we can review them and look for trends. So in order to do that, you need a strong vulnerability management program. So you need to know like, okay, what are all the security issues we've had in the past and what do they look like? This allows you to know your current state, like where are we now, as well as if your future efforts actually work, right? So we're gonna be doing a, a lot of work and a lot of uh, initiatives that I think are high leverage, but you want to be able to prove to yourself as well as upper management, like, hey, the things that we're doing on are measurably improving our security posture and uh, deserve additional focus. So. Uh, there's lots of things to track. Here's just a couple of examples. So ideally for each security issue, you know, like, was this a low, medium, or high risk? What was the vulnerability class? Was it related to access controls or XSS and so forth? So I encourage you to create a taxonomy for your company. I think OWASP top 10 is a little bit too narrow, but something like VRT is maybe a little bit too broad. Um, I would aim for maybe 20 to 40 categories. Um, you want each sort of bucket of uh, vulnerability class to have like a different root cause and fix. So you want enough that uh, you can differentiate between uh, different bugs, but not like so many buckets that every bug is in uh, sort of its own bucket because you want to be able to look for trends. Ideally, you also have the pull request 
uh, either introducing and or fixing the issue. So you want to know like what does the buggy code look like and what does the fix look like? And then you also want to know what's the relevant code base and sort of the team and org uh, responsible. Okay, so in most companies uh, I've worked with, you don't necessarily have this like super nicely groomed list of vulnerabilities to review. So you have to do some manual work to try to create this input set into this process. So here's a couple of things you can do if you, if you don't have a nice uh, set of vulnerabilities. Um, in the future, it can be better, but for now, like let's start with what we have. Uh, so many companies have a specific tag, either uh, for Jira or GitHub issues, that's like, hey, this is a security related thing. So you can search for that if you have it. Uh, you can also create a list of security relevant keywords, such as uh, vulnerability, XSS, SQL injection, security, hack, or something like that. And then search uh, every pull request and issue and git commit history for those keywords. Uh, you can use like git log uh, and then pass in one of the keywords, for example. If you use security tools such as SAST and DAST, this is another great source, as is uh, pen test reports, bug bounty submissions, uh, or even just asking development and ops teams or other security teams like, hey, what sort of issues have we had in the past? Can you point me to anything? And so again, like fully analyzing all of your ad hoc historical data, uh, this could be a time sinkhole. So it might not be worth doing it to the nth degree, just you know, do it enough so you have a, at least some input data. Uh, but what you can do now uh, is create and document a lightweight. And by lightweight, I mean something that you can continuously do over time. It's not gonna be so much of a burden that you stop. A uh, standardized process where you track this uh, vulnerability meta information uh, going forward. So. Yes, you might ha not have exactly the data you want now, but you can do things now that make, say, one, two, three years from now, you um, much better informed and data-driven as a security program. OK, so once you have this input set, I would encourage you to slice and dice it. You could group by vulnerability class or what found it, and maybe you want to weight by the severity and, and risk. Uh, so one uh, example of a number of things you can do once you have nice vulnerability data uh, was described by Arkady in his talk, uh, Data-Driven Bug Bounty. So this is just one of the figures from the talk. I would encourage you to check it out. Uh, but you can see here, like, oh, security misconfiguration and sensitive data exposure, these seem to be the most prevalent issues. So maybe we want to focus there, or at least uh, examine it. OK, so once you uh, have a couple of bug classes um, picked out, review the fixes and ask yourself questions like, OK, what did the vulnerable code look like? What did the fix look like? And what sort of trends can we see? So uh, ideally, in the best case, all of the vulnerable code looks similar. And this is going to allow us to generalize and target it. Uh, and then in the worst case, you know, every uh, instance of a bug, for example, cross-site scripting, has like a different source and a different cause. So in that case, it's going to be a, a bit hard to generalize and stamp it out, unfortunately. So again, going back to our common selection criteria, in an ideal world, you're going to be able to choose a vulnerability class that is widespread across many teams and repos. It's high risk. It's feasible to get developers to fix it. And it aligns with your company priorities. And again, it's always broken in the same way. So realistically, probably not all of these are going to be the case for every bug class. But if you can have at least, say, a couple of these or most of them, uh, it's going to be much easier and better for you to target those vulnerabilities. OK, so one thing I wanted to point out is, uh, depending on what the weakness and what the vulnerability is, there's different approaches that are going to be better or worse. Um, so for example, let's say there is some sort of big picture architectural flaws that keep biting you. Well, then you probably want something like threat modeling, because those sorts of issues are related to how things fit together and not necessarily something that's obvious from the code. So you might want to do threat modeling. Uh, but in this talk, just for the sake of time, we're going to focus on, OK, when we have known good or known bad code, how can we address that with lightweight static analysis? But again, just the key point here is there's many types of issues. Don't try to apply the same approach to every issue, because it really depends. Some are much better or much worse, depending on the situation. OK, so step three is we want to select a safe pattern and then make it the default. So how do we know what a safe pattern is? Perhaps your company has internal coding guidelines already, or you want to align to a standard like NIST. Maybe you have your own expertise. Uh, but I would also encourage you not to reinvent the wheel, right? So OWASP has a number of great resources, the Cheat Sheet Project, as well as ASVS. You know, why not learn from sort of the best the industry has written over time? And then the second part of that, how do we make it the default? So we want to update various internal coding guidelines used by security as well as developers so that whenever, we'll, whenever someone goes to say, oh, how do I do this thing, uh, they come across the secure by default uh, pattern that we have created for them. 
So this means updating things like readmes, developer docs, wiki pages, facts, training slides, onboarding presentations, uh, and et cetera. So the key thing here is like explaining why these patterns exist and also how to use them because you want people to have the right context to know why this is important. I would also encourage you to potentially work with developer, developer productivity teams. So in medium and large size companies, sometimes there's whole teams dedicated to making the rest of engineering more efficient and productive and cohesive. Um, so they probably have some very good feedback and can help you on how we can make the secure version have an even better developer user experience than the old way. This is key to getting adoption. And again, fundamentally, like how can we make developers more productive and secure? Another important tip is if you integrate security at the right points, for example, in new uh, project starter templates. So say, for example, there's a Git repo that everyone, every developer in your company will fork to create a, a new microservice or a new sort of internal component. If you put the secure defaults into there, then everyone who uses that repo, which should be everyone if that's sort of the expected practice in your company, you get this automatic widespread adoption of secure defaults without you having to encourage anyone to do anything because it's just already there. Uh, and a quote I like from Asta very much is, hitch your security wagon to developer productivity. Because ultimately developers want to move fast and get more features done. So if we can enable them to do that, of course, they'll do it. Okay, so step four, train developers to use the safe pattern. So how can we make communication successful? So we want the what and why something is insecure to be very clear using terms developers understand, not like don't do this because cross-site scripting, like the impact of that might not be clear. And if we can convey the impact in terms that developers care about, for example, risk to the business, damaging user trust, like uh, SQL injection might sound scary, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything, but say having an attacker stealing all the private messages or photos for someone like that is more viscerally impactful, maybe uh, appealing to like reliability or uptime. Uh, these are also important. And again, you want the how to fix to be concise as well as clear, you know, what should they do? And you want to link to additional docs and resources with more info. And maybe if you have Teams or Slack, you can have a channel dedicated for developers asking questions. So uh, a talk that I really like by Morgan Roman uh, called Don't Run With Scissors, he uh, also talks uh, in detail about how to get adoption of secure defaults. So I highly recommend you uh, to check out this talk. But one sort of meta structure he has for, or he recommended for communicating to developers is, you know, if you use this bad thing, this bad thing will happen. Instead, do the good thing, and it stops the bad thing. Here's an example of what not to do. Here's what to do. Um, so again, straightforward, um, but I think it emphasizes uh, clarity and actionability, which is great. OK, so step four, train developers to use the safe pattern. So there's a couple of things you can do. Uh, oftentimes, developers have onboarding sessions with a number of teams, including security. This can be a great way to start making some friends and make people aware of you. You can have educational brown bag sessions over lunch where people can listen about security. Uh, internal CTFs is a great way to get uh, developers excited about security. You can have a security champions program. Uh, and then when in-person interaction is more feasible, you can grab lunch with development teams and or schedule a happy hour. And finally, uh, <laughs> I've heard this from a couple of companies, but having candy on the desks uh, of the security team is one of the highest leverage ways to um, hear what developers care about and to uh, make friends heard this from a bunch of people, so give it a try. And finally, after we've done all these things, we're going to use tools to enforce the safe pattern. So uh, essentially, the, sort, the short story is we're going to use lightweight static analysis, that is grep or linting, to ensure that these safe patterns that we've defined are used. Uh, but I'm going to uh, pass this off to my colleague Isaac, who's going to talk about making this real in a lot more detail. Great. So we just heard from Clint a whole bunch of you know, very specific steps about how you can eradicate vulnerabilities in your application. And what I'm gonna do is take us through those steps again uh, as a quick recap, and then go into some very specific applied tools and techniques that we can use to actually effectively make them real. So just as a reminder, because there was a lot of content in uh, the previous section, there were five steps to eradicating vulnerabilities. The first one was evaluating which vulnerability class to focus on then determining the best approach to find or prevent it at scale. Next, selecting a safe pattern and making it the default, then training the developers to use that pattern, and then finally using tools to enforce the same pattern. So I'm gonna zoom in on two of these specifically and show you first how to set up continuous code scanning uh, and what the best practices are for that. And then for the last one, 
show you how to check for what are effectively escape hatches inside secure frameworks. So let's look at the first one, continuous code scanning. Uh, this has actually been covered a lot, both at AppSec USA over the years and at other DevSecOps conferences. So we're gonna link the slides uh, at the end of the presentation and you can refer back to these as a reference. What I'm gonna try to do is just distill down a couple of the core principles that I think are in common across all of these presentations uh, for you to look at. So the best practices uh, that most of these presentations agree on are first off, the unit of scan ought to be the pull request. So there's too much variance in how developers treat commits. Sometimes people you know, will commit very, very frequently. Sometimes they'll commit very, very infrequently. But generally at pull request stage, a developer is saying, hey, we're merging code. We would like a feature review here. Uh, I'm looking for feedback from my peers. And it's a good time to get feedback from the security team as well. The second thing is you want to scan fast. And when I say fast, I mean ideally less than five minutes, really no more than 10. And the reason for that is that this is giving feedback while context is fresh. Uh, no one wants to come and have to reload all of the state into their head a day or a week later. That doesn't preclude you from doing longer scans uh, you know, that are more in-depth on a different frequency. And in fact, one of the other best practices we see is that there's often a recommendation to have two separate scanning workflows. So a first workflow, which is for auditing, uh, and that's basically visible only to you on the security team. And a second workflow, which is actually blocking, which will either prevent a merge or show things directly to the developer. And another principle that uh, you know most of these presentations have in common is that it's really important to make adjustment easy. So you're gonna be setting up this flow, you're gonna want to iterate it, iterate on it a lot. So you wanna make it really cheap to add and remove tools. And even within those tools, you wanna make sure that it's really cheap to add or remove new rules. So if we look at a really specific example of what this looks like, uh, this is an excerpt from the Google Tricorder paper. So Tricorder is Google's internal code review system. And this is how both security and non-security findings are integrated into the system. Uh, so I think it gives us a helpful illustrative, illustrative example that we can pull out some of the best practices that those other papers were talking about and look at them really specifically. So the first thing you'll notice is that we're showing the tool finding within the developer system. Um, so we don't have, hey, like some ID fired at this line of code. Instead, it's in line where we're looking at the code. The message that's being displayed is clear and actionable. I actually think this one could be a little more actionable uh, and it has a link to more information. And then we're actually, these two buttons, please fix and not useful, the hyperlinks there, those are not for the security team, those are for the developer. And based on what the developer clicks, there's going to be metrics captured about the check type, uh, the scan runtime for it, and also the true or false positive rates because Google will interpret clicking not useful as a false positive. And then the final thing that they're going to do is track and evict low signal checks. So the general recommendation here is you want 95% true positives or better. Otherwise, you're basically just going to burn credibility and goodwill with the developer team as well as creating a tremendous amount of extra work for yourself, which is not valuable. So what are, we, what are we hoping to continuously find? Well, this presentation has been about eradicating vulnerabilities. So the whole idea here is, all right, if we're using secure frameworks that maintain invariants, then all we need to do is detect the functions that let you escape from those invariants, AKA escape hatches. So for instance, earlier in the presentation, we were talking about React, the escape hatch that we'd like to find in React is dangerously set HTML. If we're concerned about remote code execution, you know, the escape hatch from our memory safe language is a function like exec. So specifically, uh, how are we actually going to find escape hatches? And there are a couple of options here. Uh, the first one, uh, which might seem crazy to you, but I've actually encountered a lot of really good security teams who have gotten a lot of leverage out of it is grep. So grep is easy to use, it's interactive, it's fast. Most people know regular expressions already. Um, and you know, if we're just looking for a function named exec, it's going to do the job. It's going to potentially trigger on some things that it shouldn't. Uh, and that's because of the con here, it's line oriented. So there's a little bit of a mismatch, well, a pretty big mismatch between uh, 
a textual tool and the tree-like structures of programs. So the abstract syntax tree, if you're familiar with the term, which is why many people will either use or build a plugin to a code-aware linter, which I've listed here as the second option. So the pro there is that we're robust and precise. We're going to handle white space properly, comments properly. The con, uh, you know, is that each parser represents ASTs differently. So we have to learn, you know, for each language that we want to use, we have to set up a parser for it. And then we have to figure out how that parser represents the AST nodes that we care about, uh, which is a pretty significant amount of overhead uh, and requires some expertise. So is there anything, uh, is there anything else in this category? Well, in fact, there is. Uh, and actually for that, we turned to an early Facebook tool uh, that was made when Facebook was a much younger company, which actually formed a lot of their early program analysis infrastructure. So full disclosure, this is a shameless plug uh, because we at my company are now uh, the maintainers of this tool, uh, but it's still open source and we love it. So it was originally developed at Facebook. It's called SimGrep to encourage secure code patterns. Basically it's customizable, lightweight, static analysis tool for finding bugs. Uh, we've been building a community around it and you're gonna hear about some of the OWASP collaboration that's happening later, uh, but basically developing you know hundreds of existing community rules. And the whole idea with the tool which you'll see an example of in a second, is to combine the speed and customization of grep with the expressiveness of more of a traditional static analysis tool. So it runs online, doesn't require compilation, it's open source. Uh, and one of the coolest things I think is that it doesn't require you to learn some very complicated domain specific language. Generally the patterns you're gonna write are going to look very similar to the source code that you're targeting. And you can see the supported languages there. So the pros uh, to SimGrep are, it is very good at handling languages with more than one way to do it. So if you are targeting a language like Ruby, where there's like, I don't know, four ways to call a function, you can write one of them and SimGrep will figure out all of the equivalent variations. And it's a single tool for multiple languages with a relatively simple pattern language. Uh, the con is going to be that it's slower than grep. And of course, not all languages are supported, unlike with grep. So what does that actually look like? If we go back to the exec example, say we're trying to you know, prove that our app doesn't have remote code execution, you can just invoke SimGrep on the command line with dash E and then the expression that you want to find. So in this case, the expression is just exec, left paren, dot, 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 right paren. So this is, uh, you know, there are two sort of extensions to the programming language that SimGrep provides. The first extension is this dot, dot, dot operator which is kind of like a wild card uh, or a dot star in grep. And it's basically just saying, I don't care whether there's zero or one or more arguments to this function, just trigger on all of them. And you'll see that compared to, you know, if we were just doing a dumb grep for the same sort of thing, uh, we're missing line eight, line 16 and line 18, which is exactly what we want. We don't want to be triggering on some exec. We don't want to be triggering on commented out code or code that is inside a string. And what's really cool, I think, is that if you look at line one, SimGrep is actually properly mapping through this import. So if you don't know Python, the developer is importing exec, they're renaming it to be safe function, and then they're calling safe function. But SimGrep is smart enough to kind of track through that import aliasing. So that's really cool. Um, that was a fairly basic example. If we look at a more complex example, um, here we have you know, like an equivalent sort of thing in Java but in Java, the exec function only matters if it comes from Java Lang runtime. So in this example, we're using the SimGrep expression to actually specify some placeholder for the variable name. So it could be RT or it could be other. In this case, capital dollar, dollar sign capital X is just a placeholder for, hey, I don't care what the variable name specifically here is. Then we're using the same sort of pattern. You can see we've specified the type uh, and this is triggering on line seven and nine, but not on line 12, where another object with a method name exec is being called. Uh, so that's cool. And there are some links down here that you can go play around with if you're looking at the slides uh, and just try it out in an interactive live editor, or you can run it offline on the command line. What's really interesting about a tool like SimGrep is that it lowers the bar so much to writing something that is you know, effectively a custom static analysis tool that you can start to add your own business logic checks. So let's say for instance, that you know you say have an application where you know that a developer should always be calling some function named verify transaction before they call make transaction. Um, here are the SimGrep patterns that you would use to enforce this on your code base. 
So you can see I'm actually in this case combining two patterns. Uh, and if you click through to the try it and solution things, you'll see exactly uh, how this works on a real example. But basically I'm just saying, hey, I want to find any code. And you can see I'm using these dot, dot, dot operators to say I don't care about what happens before or after this line. So any function that calls make transaction, but is not a function which has verify transaction coming first. So that's pretty cool. Um, and I think the, the real power of this is, you know, at the, at the most base level, if the developers don't actually love the security team, all of this work for trying to eradicate vulnerabilities and secure defaults can be compromised. So here's an example from the British government's evaluation uh, of the Huawei source code, where they found that developers had used a pound define, basically redefined the name of a safe function to be the unsafe one. Uh, <laughs> so the real takeaway here is, all right, like. All this great, you know, like eradicating vulnerability static analysis tools, it doesn't matter if we don't consider the psychology of the developer. So what we need is three simple ways to make developers love you. Uh, and hint, it's not finding more vulnerabilities in their code. Uh, I'm just gonna run through, you know, like kind of collating across all the things that I've seen, what are those best practices from a tool that is trying to inspect source code for vulnerability eradication? So the first thing is to be fast. Uh, you know, we covered this under continuous scanning, but now we're considering it from the developer's perspective. And really, I think the takeaway here is don't come in last. So security checks should not be the slowest thing blocking the developer from merging. It's okay to be slow as long as you're not as slow as you know the build and the other checks that are going to be required to prevent the developer from getting the dopamine rush of clicking that green merge button. The second thing is to be early. If you are gonna make me fix something, as a developer, I want you to tell me as soon as possible, uh, ideally in the editor. Here we have a, a Visual Studio code with a SEMrep extension installed on the right. And the third thing and last thing is people love easy buttons. If you can provide an auto fix and just make the process of fixing security problems fast and easy, even if you don't have a perfect patch that is just like click to apply this fix and it's actually going to perfectly fix the code, even an imperfect suggestion is a lot better than nothing. Uh, so we've actually extended SimGrep since its Facebook days to have support for some auto fixing. You're seeing an animation of that here down below. And one of the cool things is you can use you can the same sort of pattern language that you use to specify the query can be used to specify the fix, which is really cool. So we've covered uh, you know some applied techniques and tools for actually making this real with your you know interfacing with the development team. What about interfacing uh, you know, with the people, the sorts of people who develop frameworks? And one of the coolest things I think is that, uh, you know, again, referencing building secure and reliable systems by Google, Google has actually mapped every OWASP top 10 vulnerability to a framework hardening measure. Um, so you know, there's something that you can do at the framework level for each one of the OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities. And in fact, we've been working with OWASP uh, specifically on this. So, SimGrep and OWASP uh, have been collaborating on ASVS and the OWASP cheat sheets. So the goal here is to get out of the box support for like, hey, there's a tool that you can just run, which will verify, ah, is my code compliant with ASVS level one, which was specifically designed to be automatable? Or if you're reading a security cheat sheet from OWASP, you can have a rule set that you can just use to run and say, hey, like, I have a project, I'm looking at this cheat sheet. Is there any code here that violates the cheat sheet recommendations? And I'm really excited about this because I think it gives us an opportunity to kind of um, codify in a really automated way a lot of the great domain knowledge that we have as security experts and make it more accessible to a larger number of people by having it actually be not just a cheat sheet that you can read, but a cheat sheet that you can execute or a standard that you can execute. Uh, it really starts to, I think, just make it much easier to distribute that security knowledge rather than having it locked up in a wiki. So yeah, um, in conclusion, if there's just a few things that you take away from the talk, let it be this. First off, secure defaults are the best way to scalably raise your security bar, not by playing bug whack-a-mole. Second, killing bug classes is going to produce compounding results. It's going to make your AppSec team more leveraged. And the way that you should do that is by basically defining a safe pattern, educating developers uh, as you roll it out, and then figuring out a way to enforce it continuously 
for which you're going to need fast and lightweight tools. Uh, SimGrep might fit some of your use cases there. And you're really going to want to focus on the developer experience with that tool. So I hope you've enjoyed our talk on eradicating uh, vulnerability classes. We would love to uh, chat with you from the OWASP cheat sheet side or the SimGrep side. Uh, you know, whatever we've presented that could be useful. And we're going to be posting the slides at the URL below. Uh, go out and uh, eradicate some vulnerabilities. Thank you very much.